In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We have concluded our Lenten journey. And this morning we celebrate Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This entire weekend, with the raising of Lazarus, and today with the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, is a kind of forefeast of Pascha, a foretaste of the joy that is to come. It's a weekend of light that's juxtaposed between two periods of darkness, you might say, two great and painful journeys of asceticism, one that we've just completed and one that looms in front of us in this coming great and holy week. Like the Jews of old, we too gather to greet the Messiah this morning, holding palms of victory and rejoicing at his coming. We greet the Messiah, but what kind of Messiah are we greeting? Who is this man? Many thousands of people gathered to hail the Messiah as he entered into Jerusalem. For some time he'd been making his way through village after village with his face set towards Jerusalem. The people gathered around him wild with enthusiasm, expectation. His own disciples could hardly contain their excitement as they walked to Jerusalem with him, talking about the kingdom and what was to come. They knew beyond all doubt that he was the Messiah. They knew beyond all doubt that he would establish his kingdom. But what kind of Messiah and what kind of kingdom? The crowds of people yelled, laughed with joy, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, the Messiah is coming. What was it that they expected? Pure and simple, they expected that he would drive the Romans out. They expected him to lead the people in a successful revolt against the hated infidels, to purify their city, to drive the Roman occupiers from their sacred land and to set up their Jewish kingdom and reestablish Israel as a great power. Nothing less. That was their expectation in its entirety. They knew he could do it. He could feed thousands of people didn't matter how many people gathered around him in the wilderness. He could feed them, so they knew they could withstand any siege. Replenishing supplies would not be a problem. He could take one loaf and multiply it over and over and over again. Just think what he could do with spears and swords. Give him a sword and watch. We could arm an army. He could heal the sick. He could raise the dead. So dealing with the wounded wouldn't be a problem. They would be an invincible army. Nothing could stop them. Were any of them just a little troubled or confused when he entered into Jerusalem seated on a donkey? Where was the great war horse fit for a general to lead them in battle? You don't lead your troops seated on a donkey. Well, never mind. Hosanna, the king is coming. When Jesus was entering Jerusalem, the understanding of every Jewish person without exception was that the Messiah was a man of grandeur and great power, and he would overthrow the enemy and establish the kingdom. This was especially the expectation of his 12 disciples. Over and over and over, for three years, Jesus had attempted to teach them about the nature of the kingdom, the nature of his own ministry, the nature of the Messiah. Not far from Jerusalem, he told them very clearly, as clearly as he could, that he was going to his death, that he would be handed over to lawless men and lawless men would crucify him. And what was the response? James and John took him aside quietly, privately, and in effect said, right, right, of course, but now listen, we want you to do whatever we ask. What kind of opening request is that? He's just told them that he's going to his death, and yes, 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 right. But let's get to the serious stuff. We want you to do a favor for us, whatever we ask. Jesus replies, well, what is it that you want? And their response is, when you restore the kingdom, let us sit one on your left and one on your right. 
This wasn't just for official portraits. They were saying, let us have the greatest positions of power in your kingdom. Kind of like Joseph had with the Pharaoh. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus replied. Can you undergo my baptism? Can you drink from the cup that I will drink of? Oh, sure, no problem. Three times under the water, we saw it, we watched you, we got this. They had no idea what they were asking. They had no idea to whom they were posing the question, really. After three years, they did not know him. How disheartening for the Lord. The other disciples, when they learned of it, were angry with the brothers, but likely they were angry because they beat them to it. The fact is, not one of them, and no one in the crowd in Jerusalem, understood what kind of Messiah this was, what kind of kingdom he had because everyone knew what the Messiah was and what he was meant to do, and they couldn't wait for him to get on, to it, on with it, and so they weren't really listening to what he had to say. They were projecting onto him their own vision of who he was, creating a Messiah in their own image. And immediately, instead of driving the infidels out of Jerusalem, he drives the Jewish money changers out of the temple. What's going on here? This isn't what you're supposed to be doing. It's not what we were expecting. When are you going to get on with the real business at hand? Stop fooling around and do what we ask you to do. And are we any different today? It seems to me that many of us have even less excuse than the apostles who had spent three years with him, but how many years have we spent with the Gospels? How many years have we spent in church with the feasts? And yet, what kind of Messiah are we looking for who is Jesus for us? Each one of us has our own ideas about who Jesus is and what he's meant to do, especially in our own lives. When is he going to get to it and sort my life out? When is he going to end my struggles, to end my problems, to end my, my boredom, my suffering? If he's the Messiah and I'm his disciple, then why am I struggling like this? What's wrong? Sadly, we're very much like those first disciples with our own strong ideas of who he is and what he should do, and like them, we're wrong. Just like the disciples, we often find ourselves shocked and unprepared for what takes place by what happens in our lives and in our church. We're still not fully formed to understand and to welcome the Messiah who is the suffering servant of God the crucified Messiah who humbly accepts humiliation without retaliating, the Messiah who was spit upon, who was mocked, who was cursed. We still do not understand his ways and we do not understand the way of the cross. We want the Messiah, but we want our Messiah and we want him to come and do our will. We're about to enter great and holy week. And there are many services during which we can and we should pray and contemplate the suffering servant of God, this crucified God-man and his way of the cross. And if we avail ourselves and attend the services and listen and pray, we'll have plenty of time to do that and perhaps by God's grace come to a deeper understanding of who he is and what he does in our life. This morning, yes, emulate the thousands of Jews in Jerusalem who welcome the king. Let us also cry, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and let us celebrate and rejoice. And then beginning this week, beginning this evening, come together to pray and to contemplate who he truly is. Come to this week's services and open your heart and your mind to be instructed. Who is Christ? Who has he come to be in my life? We who are called his disciples. May God illumine the eyes of our hearts and our minds to understand the saving mysteries of his salvation to the glory of God. Amen.